then also we have Michael Threshler, who is our main host. He's going to introduce himself and talk a little bit more about what we're going to do today in just a moment. But a few business things. So first off, if you're having problems with Zoom, 99% of the time you can fix it by either turning your Zoom off and then re-signing in or by uh, turning your whole browser off, your internet browser off, and then opening it back up and signing into Zoom again. Or if that doesn't work, restarting your computer and then signing into Zoom again. If you have more problems about that, you can message me privately in the chat and I will try to figure out any technical issues. However, we are now recording this webinar. So never fear, if something happens, if you get kicked out, if you have to leave for a second, um, whether a recording of this webinar will be available to you also, we, we have a lot of information to cover. We tend to talk pretty fast. So um, again, you'll be able to look at this recording so you know that you won't miss anything. Um, so then a few other things uh, just before we start. So at the end of this webinar, the next like day or two, you will get an email from us and email will have um, information um, just about the uh, the webinar going forward. We're going to give you a PDF of all the slides that we use so that you will have that. Um, we also have a training evaluation that I'm going to link at the end of this webinar and we're also going to put it in that email. Um, we would, we really, really value uh, the training evaluations because um, doing these types of trainings is, uh, it's, it's getting more comfortable for us, but we're still fairly new at it. And honestly, uh, teachers, needs and perspectives have been changing as we go forward and we just want to make sure that we are serving you the best way we possibly can. Now, if you fill out that training evaluation, you will get an email from us saying you were at this webinar. That proves that you were here. However, some people have expressed to us that their schools require them to have a fancy certificate that has their name on it and everything. If you need a fancy certificate, um, when you fill out that training evaluation, there'll be something that you can click that says you want that. Uh, if you want that, we do charge $15 for that just because it's time for us to have to go through and do all of that. But never fear, if you just need the email that says that you were here, you fill out the training evaluation, we'll give you the end, you'll get an email that says that. Um, okay, so now I do have, um, uh, I, oh, I also wanna say, if you fill out the training evaluation, you'll get a free lesson um that uh for the smarts program that's also available on our website yep. um and in the chat right now is uh a links to all of our various websites and various social media accounts so uh we actually have so if you see in the chat there's research ild the research institute for learning learning and development um and that is our parent organization so they do all the research about executive function they have a lot of great programs there we have a few conferences coming up. I'm going to tell you about in a moment. So you can find out that stuff there. Then Smarts Online, uh, smarts-ef.org. Uh, that is the website for the entire Smarts program. And that has all the information you could ever need about Smarts. It's got information about our 30 lesson. Oh, oh we got somebody from Canada. Mm. Uh. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Uh, uh, that's great. Um, uh, so the SMARTS online website, it has everything about our 30 lesson secondary curriculum and our 30 lesson uh, elementary curriculum. It's got, again, we said the free lessons. We also have a blog up there that we update with interesting articles um, every single week. So that's a lot of free content there. Also, we'd love it if you um, followed us on the SMARTS YouTube channel. Um, we are putting up, we will be putting up this uh, video training um, on the SMARTS YouTube channel in, uh, in about a week or so. But also we have a whole free webinar playlist on the SMARTS YouTube channel of all of our free webinars. You can just go and watch them at your leisure. Also, like we say, we're a small company. We love to hear from you all. So um, if you wanna reach out to us at our Twitter or our Facebook, we would love uh, to hear more about that. Um, but the major thing I wanna let you know before we get started is, is that we have our SMARTS Summer Summit, which is coming up very shortly, July 28th, 30th, August 4th, and the 6th. But we are running our early bird special. So if this is a, it's an online conference that you're interested in, I think it's 10 hours of instruction. Is that right? Something like um, that. Yes, for the summit, absolutely. For the summit, yeah. Um, so you can follow that link there, but because uh, the early bird special is 
closing tomorrow. I wanted to make sure that you had that information. And again, you could talk uh, more about that with us. And of course, we're going to put this in the email and I'll go over this uh, one more time when we are at the end of this webinar. And then um, we, I also just wanted to put in the link. You have the link to the SMARTS website, but um, if you want the direct link to more information about the SMARTS curriculum, I will put that there. That's our SMART subscriptions. It's 30 lessons um, and it's good for an entire year. And there's uh, all sorts of PowerPoints and worksheets and videos that are all there to support those lessons. So, okay, Michael, have I forgotten anything before we go forward? Uh, no, I think that's pretty good for housekeeping to begin. All right, excellent. So, okay, let us uh, move forward and let me turn it over to you, Michael Freshler. All right, wonderful. Um, so thank you so much, Elizabeth, for kind of giving me that intro. Um, uh, just a really quick kind of kind of who I am. Um, so my name, ooh, we're starting. All right, so my name is Michael Greshler. I am the director of the SMARTS program. Um, I've been working at Research LD for a while. And um, on the development of the SMARTS program, you know, we've done a lot of work to create these materials and these PowerPoints. I do a lot of the outreach to schools and professional development. So, you know, I think I am kind of the best person to kind of give you this lead through of executive function in secondary school, combined with kind of walkthrough of the SMARTS program and how we're seeing it used at so many different kind of schools and educational settings around the country. Um, I'm just going to kind of jump right in, but I do talk fast. Elizabeth warned you. Feel free to say something in the chat if you want me to slow down a bit or, uh, you know, if you have any questions, especially kind of about the unique um, situations, the strengths and challenges of your student, don't hesitate to put those in there. If I'm not able to address it while I'm talking, we should have some time towards the end and I'll absolutely give you my email at the end to follow, continue the conversation. So this is the agenda of what we're hoping Sorry, I hit an interesting button there. Uh, this is the agenda of what we're hoping to accomplish today. So really kind of taking a second to position ourselves and make sure we know what we mean when we say what is executive function. You know, it's a very hot topic, um, but I want to make sure we're all using the same language. Then we're going to kind of get into those struggles. What is it? What do executive function challenges at the secondary level even look like? I'm going to take you through the structure of the smart secondary curriculum, and then we're going to look at the different places that executive function is often implemented in secondary schools. And finally, I'll leave you with six steps and some questions you can use to kind of develop your own customized plan to integrate executive function into your um, school or learning environment. Um, so I'm going to fly through this stuff. This is Research ILD. This is who we are. Um, the only thing I will add, education nonprofit, executive function is in our mission statement, okay? So even the IRS knows that we are all about executive function. Um, Lynn Meltzer is kind of our president, leader, EF guru, all things executive function. She's been doing this work for a long time with a lot of really wonderful institutions, uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education, Tufts, the Children's Hospital in Boston. So really some wonderful work, um, not only with you know schools, but a lot of other researchers, psychologists, et cetera. Um, she's written so many great books on executive function. I'll do a quick plug for the green one. We call it the green book in the office. That is my EF you know, go-to. I have a copy at home, a copy in the office, take a copy to the beach. If you're looking to do some EF reading, I can highly, highly recommend that one. Perfect for teachers. Um, and Lynn, uh, Elizabeth did mention our upcoming events. We'd love to see you at our EF Summit, our virtual learning difference conference. It's a brave new world for PD and conferences, but executive function is more important than ever. So feel free to join us and really deepen your EF know-how. Um, okay, so SMARTS. Um, just so what is SMARTS? Because you're going to see SMARTS all over everything. So I just want to take a second and kind of give you that high level definition. So SMARTS is an executive function strategy instruction curriculum, right? It's research based, um, piloted in many, many schools across the country. And we're going to kind of look at the structure more, but I just where SMARTS comes from, SMARTS is an acronym. It stands for strategies, motivation, awareness, resilience, talents, and success. And each one of those is a component of the program as we will see. Um, SMARTS actually has an interesting origin story. Um, it began as a community 
uh, program in our learning center where older students work with younger students on executive function strategies, um, teaching each other the strategies they could use, but using fun activities like let's use planning to go apple picking. Let's break down directions to um, make a peanut butter sandwich, which was a lot of fun and really supportive and powerful. So we moved it out to a number of kind of schools in the greater Boston area. Elizabeth was instrumental um, in, that, in that phase. And you know, that went very well. So we received some funding from the Oak Foundation to create a comprehensive online executive function curriculum. We started off with the secondary curriculum, which was piloted in 2014 and launched um, to publicly in 2015. Since then, we've gone on to add an elementary component and we worked very hard to revise our assessment tools and some of the curricular materials. Um, you know, since that time, we've reached over 2,000 educators um, in the, across the United States and even in countries around the world. So we love having some international teachers here today. Um, you know, I'm so proud to have worked with SMARTS as we've developed what's really becoming a kind of K-12 EF pipeline. Um, because as we'll see, executive function, a lot of times it comes up in middle school and high school, but it really matters across the lifespan of students as well as teachers, right? So I'm so proud to work with this company as we kind of develop the materials and supports that we can use to promote executive function for all students um, everywhere, all right? So that's just my quick little intro to executive function. Oh, to smarts. Now we're gonna get into my little intro for executive function. You know, what is executive function? It's a really important question. And if you Google it, you know, classic research, I Google it, you're gonna get 10 different answers for 10 different websites. So I wanna take a second and make sure when we talk about executive function, we're talking about the same thing. And here's why. So this, in one of my other lives, in my, one of the other hats I wear, I do some EF coaching. I do some educational therapy, mostly middle school, high school, and college, mostly boys, a lot of ADHD or, you know, I'm at risk for school failure. And I'll ask them, first time I meet them, I ask them, what is executive function? So just think about what do you think your students would say if you asked them that? So here are some real quotes from real students, and I think you'll believe me when you see them. I don't know what it is, but I know I don't have it. Okay, so here's a kid who he is identified for special education. He's in his first IEP meeting and he says, the school psychologist said, I have no executive function. Now, I don't think the school psychologist said that. If you know psychologists, they would never speak in such absolute terms anyway. Um, but that's the message that he took away. And this is, remember, he's coming to me to work on his EF and he already says, I can't do it. Um, this is even sadder, the stuff that I'm bad at. This is a kid who I saw his um, neuropsych evaluation and he had a verbal IQ of like 122 or something like that, like real, real powerful intellectual strengths. But he does struggle with EF related tasks and he says, oh, I'm bad at that stuff. And here's a kid that we're getting ready to ship off to college, okay? Um, and then finally, it's doing whatever the teacher says. So this is a kid who's telling me, oh, you know, I, whatever the teacher says, that's what I'm gonna try to do. And I, I love, I mean, well, I love, I would love the idea that my, my students will do everything I say, but that's not executive function either. And this is a kid who's heading into his first year of middle school, and is he going to be ready for the um, increased demands of independence that middle school asks? So I don't, I'm not necessarily gonna say that our definition of executive function is the only one you can use, but it's very important that we create a definition of executive function that addresses the danger of this. The kids saying, I'm bad at this stuff, I cannot do it. When we look at, so this is how um, Dr. Meltzer kind of breaks down executive function. These, you know, it's an umbrella term for these goal-directed cognitive tasks, and many different researchers agree on that. But the breakdown is different. You know, some, uh, there are some researchers who say there's one executive function, inhibition, you want the marshmallow, you're not gonna eat the marshmallow. Um, there's some who say there's seven executive function pieces. Some say there's nine. Uh, George McCloskey, who is the author of the brief, which is like the EF questionnaire that psychologists use, I saw a presentation where he said there are 39 executive functions. Now, he's brilliant, he's a brilliant speaker. I hope if you have a chance to, you should absolutely look up George McCloskey. However, as an educator, I don't have time for 39 different executive functions. And for those kids who are telling me they're bad at it, I don't have time to teach them that there's 39 different things and you're not bad at all of them. So in SMARTS, we use a very concrete breakdown of executive function. When I talk to my kids about executive function, I'm talking about organizing. Organizing um, time, organizing materials, organizing information, uh, goal setting, setting goals for 
uh, what matters for you. It could be the assignment. What is the desired outcome of this assignment and what are the steps to accomplish that? It could be personal, um, you know, a, a goal in sports or drama or a goal for your life. Um, shifting flexibly, the ability to shift your approaches. It could be, you know, your schedule changes and you shift how you're going to approach the day. Um, you shift the rules of a game as it gets harder or you enter the final stages. You shift your perspective so you can understand someone else's point of view. Um, so, you, you know, Dr. Meltzer says that shifting is actually the most important one. It's the gateway to all the others, right? Um, and just to finish up, accessing working memory, that's my brain's kind of internet bandwidth. Um, can I juggle all the different things I'm being asked to do, or am I going to kind of get overloaded? Too many tabs open on my mental browser, and things need to shut down. And finally, self-checking and self-monitoring. Um, self-checking is, let me put on a new pair of glasses and look at the assignment again and make sure I did it to satisfaction, versus self-monitoring. I'm going to wear that hat and say, am I on task right now? Am I doing what I should do? And when I take executive function and turn it into those concrete behaviors that um, students you know, are doing throughout their day, it becomes more about, okay, what are we doing? What strategy can we use in this area? And it becomes less about this nebulous thing that a psychologist said you're bad at, although I know psychologists would never say that. So I, that was a crash course in our five areas. I do encourage you, if you wanna learn more about that, um, check out that playlist that Elizabeth mentioned. We did a, we did a webinar um, in late March called Understanding Executive Function, the Key to Successful Learning. And in that one, we go way deeper in those EF areas. So I encourage you to check that out if you wanna learn more. And throughout all of those EF areas, executive function in general, there is this undercurrent of metacognition. You cannot teach executive function if you do not also um, teach metacognition, the opportunity to build a deeper understanding of how you think and learn and what your strengths and challenges are. So this is also coming from George McCloskey. I'm telling you, that guy blew my mind. He said, if a kid comes into your office and you say, do X, Y, and Z, you're teaching them EF strategy, do X, Y, and Z, and the kid without thinking does X, Y, and Z, that's not executive function. You know, when you look at the brain, executive function coming from the prefrontal cortex, and you, when a kid has, when they're engaging executive function or an adult, the prefrontal cortex is lit up. They're thinking about why they're doing it. What is the point of this strategy? What is it going to help me do? Do I like it or not? How does this relate to who I am as a learner? If you're not building in opportunities for those sorts of questions into your executive function support, you aren't actually doing executive function. You're just telling a kid what to do. And I think that's a big problem that we see when it comes to executive function. I mean, EF is everywhere. You know, think of, think of elementary school. EF is woven into the very carpet. Like there's a purple circle for group time and there's an orange circle for independent reading time. That's executive function. But if kids don't have a chance to build that self-understanding, they don't own those strategies and they can't do it on their own. And as kids get older and older, as we'll see, the expectation that they know themselves as learners goes up and up and up. But if we aren't giving them opportunities to develop that, I'm not sure that um, all kids can keep up with that. So this is the last theoretical paradigm I'm gonna show you, um, also coming from Dr. Meltzer. And this is kind of showing us that executive function, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. EF is not only intimately linked to students' self-understanding, but it's also linked to their self-concept and their motivation and effort. And I think I have time for a, little, a short story. Um, this is the story of the very first time I heard the term executive function. So I was teaching in Colorado and I was doing some um, academic uh, instruction, some supplemental instruction, some Title I schools. And the, I had this one student who we'll call James. And James was a ninth grade student taking geometry, which is actually a year ahead in the math standards, but he was failing geometry. Um, and he was really struggling. You know, you would try to sit down and do homework. Oh, none of his homework is getting turned in. I mean, he's failing the test. I mean, he's, he's in a really bad place. And you would try to sit down and work with him. I've, I've helped a lot of kids in geometry. It can actually be very challenging. And I'm like, okay, let me show you. And he's like, no, quiet. I just need to work. And so he'll just stare at the assignment, just staring at it, staring at it. And he's like, okay, the answer is three. I'm like, okay, this is geometry. The answer is like a triangle or a square or something like that. You know, he's not really understanding it and he doesn't want any help from the outside. Um, when you ask him about it, he'll say, I used to be good at math. I guess I'm stupid. 
I don't want to do this. And he's, so look at those different components of this paradigm. He has no strategy. He has no awareness of why it's hard. So his self-concept, his belief in himself is in the toilet. His motivation and effort is directed towards escaping class. So I asked the school psychologist, you know, what do you think I should do? Because, we're, you know, he doesn't want to work with me. He'll meet with me, but he doesn't want to work with me. And the, the psychologist says, you know what he really needs is some executive function. And I was like, great, no problem. So I went home and Googled it because I never heard of it before. And I saw that executive function means, you know, things like organization. So I said, okay, I'm going to help this kid with some organization. So the next time I see him, I did that classic trick with teenagers. Do you want to work on your homework or do you want to clean out your backpack? Because, you know, you got to give them options. And he says, clean out backpack. Yeah, I'll just clean out my backpack. And so he has like, a, this is Colorado, right? He has a big backpacking backpack that he uses to go to school. So we dump it out and I'm telling you, no folders, no binders, just paper uh, and maybe crumbled up granola bars. And it's like, oof, you know, thank goodness nothing was alive in there. And so we could start to go through it and we're making piles. And we look at this one assignment and I'm like, wait a minute, is this important? And he's like, I told my teacher I did that okay, you did it. Did you turn it in? He's like, oh, whoops, I, I guess I lost it. So we go through those papers, and by the time we're done, we found nine homeworks that he never turned in because he lost them. That's classic EF challenge, this idea of doing homework and not turning it in. So we turn those in. The teacher is very um, nice and gives him full credit, and just from that, he goes from an F to like a D, Okay, just from that alone. So I wish I wish that he was like converted to using binders and folders and he like went to Staples and bought out half the store, but no. Um, the strategy we used was we take a picture of the homework after he did it. And at the end of the week, we would send all the pictures to the teacher. And by doing that, his homework grade solidified and he went from a D to, you know, like a C. And he told me, Michael, we got to study. I got a quiz coming up. If I do well on this quiz, I can get a B in the class. So he achieved that goal. And from that point on, he knew that math could be a strength for him, but he knew he had to watch out for his organization. So if you look at this paradigm again, this paradigm can describe what happens when we don't have EF strategies, that kind of cycle of defeat, um, and kids saying, I can't do it, I guess I'm dumb, I'm not, I can't do it, I don't wanna try, versus kind of initiating a positive cycle of change, getting a strategy that the student can use to understand themselves better as a student. It restores their ability and their belief to be successful, and then they're more motivated and more effortful. So this is kind of the research paradigm underneath SMARTS. This is always what we're testing when we do school evaluation studies. And this is kind of the bigger goal, of why we even need to bring EF strategies into the school. Because this is, um, this is what an EF challenge looks like, this clogged funnel, right? This kid, um, James, I knew he could do math well. He had, he'd been doing well in the past in that, but he's really struggling. You know, these kids who we know they can do it. We know it's in there somewhere, but it doesn't come out. They clogged funnel. The funnel is clogged, and they're not able to produce to show what they know. And that's what we need strategies for, to help them unclog the funnel, to approach challenging tasks systematically and be more successful. So um, at some point during trainings like this, people will kind of approach me and say, well, what should a kid be able to do? What should a sixth grader be able to do? What should a 11th grader be able to do? And that's a very challenging question. There is no um, you know, uh, executive function standards for the country or even for the state for that matter. So you know, I, I kind of put that back on um, you guys to say, well, what are we asking students to be able to do? What are our expectations for our students? So, um, you know, if you think about executive function, it kind of happens developmentally, right? We have this thing called the zone of proximal development. I'm sure we remember that from that one pedagogy class, right? Um, and basically this is saying that everything is learned as you become developmentally able to do so. If you look at little babies, they can't tie their shoes. They have shoes, they're really cute little shoes, but they can't tie them, right? So they can't do it yet. But then when they turn like three or four or five, you know, now they can learn. So we're going to show them how to do it with big laces on a coffee can. We're going to sing the song about the bunny or tell the story about the bunny ears. And eventually with enough practice, they can do it independently. So executive function is no different. As you get older and as you're taught, you become better and better executive function. And that's the theory, right? So we're going to test that theory out. Elizabeth is going to put two links in the chat. And those links are going to be, um, there's going to be two of them. And hold on, where is the chat? I can't see it. Your chat? Um, I want to see that chat. Okay. So you see there's two, man, there are two links. Sometimes Zoom does this to me. Um, there's two links in there. And there, I want you to do the one that is based on your 
last name, okay? So if you're uh, A through M, you're gonna do this one on what can our students do? So I'm gonna ask you, Elizabeth, are those in the chat? I just can't, I can't see it for some They reason. are indeed in the chat. All right, excellent. So if you're A through M, I want you to click that link or paste it into your browser. And I want you to think about what can our students do? And I'm only focusing on one academic task, which is um, reading, identify main idea of reading. I could do this for like 30 or 40 tasks. I want you to do main idea of reading. Should a fifth grader be able to identify the main idea of what they're reading? Should an eighth grader? Should a ninth grader? And should a 12th grader? So if, you're, if your last name starts with A through M, go ahead and vote. Um, if you are an N through Z, I want you to think about how often do we teach it? So if you're a fifth grade teacher, and actually this is just kind of general for the school you work in, how often do fifth grade teachers teach strategies to identify the main idea? Eighth graders, eighth grade teachers, ninth grade teachers, and twelfth grade teachers, okay? So go ahead, I'll kind of give you a second to do that, and we'll kind of look at the answers, and I just want to see that chat that is escaping me. Chat, where are you? I feel like I miss out on all the fun, you know? There it is. Okay, nice. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm going to take a look at these, and we're going to look at the what can our students do first. So let's give it, let's let it get to 10. Okay, there we go. So let's see, what do we think our students can do? So in fifth grade, we're saying, okay, they can, they can identify a main idea if we support them. And a few of us are saying, they can't actually do that yet, right? That's actually a very challenging thing for fifth graders, especially, you know, some fifth graders are still kind of solidifying their basic literacy skills. In eighth grade, we're saying, okay, um, either they can do it with support or independently. In ninth grade, look at that, in one year, the expectation that they can be independent gets huge, going from half to 80%. Now they can do it independently. And in 12th grade, we're gonna say all of them can do it independently. Every 12th grader can or should be able to identify the main idea of what they're reading independently. Now let's look at what the teachers are doing. Ooh, a lot more people are doing this one, that's exciting. So, um, uh, it's gonna, so remember in fifth grade, we said that um, a lot of them can do it with support. And we're also saying a lot of teachers are gonna teach it. So that's nice to see that match there, right? A few people are saying not taught. Now in eighth grade, the proportion of teachers who are teaching those strategies has dropped, okay? In ninth grade, we're seeing a few more coming back in. And then in 12th grade, we're seeing almost more than half saying, I don't need to teach that, okay? I don't need to teach that anymore. Right? So you can already kind of start to tease out um, what we would expect, which is as kids get older, they're going to be more independent, right? And so that means as you get more independent, we need to teach those strategies less. So in general, we can understand where that's coming from, but why don't we talk about what could happen um, to some of our students when we do that, right? Um, how does that development change as they get older and what factors support or interfere with that development, okay? Think about some of those clogged funnels that might arise, especially thinking about some of those years like eighth to ninth grade or the entry to 12th grade. Think about how some differences in individual ability might be problematic. A student who has dyslexia um, or ADHD or who has missed a few years of schooling or is coming from, you know, um, dealing with something like PTSD, fetal alcohol syndrome, something like that, some of those challenges of identifying main idea are not going to go away. So as they go from eighth to ninth grade or into 12th grade, the expectation that they can do it on their own could create some problems. Um, another one is demands of the task. You know what's so funny is to think about what does identifying main idea look like in fifth grade versus 12th grade? So in fifth grade, you know, yes, those kids are probably reading, you know, short chapter books, if they're reading at grade level, short chapter books. And we might ask them to do a research project on like, what's your favorite animal? And they're going to do one on penguins. And we're going to give them a curated um, website that tells you sources you can find. And these sources are kind of written at grade level and they have lots of pictures. And, you know, the title is up there in size, like 20 font, right? So that's a kid who's identifying main idea with a lot of scaffolds, right? There's pictures and big bold headings and things like that. 
now think about it, what it looks like in 12th grade. In 12th grade, I'm going to say, okay, you need to research, you know, this cladogram and you're going to be doing this biological study of a species. And they're also doing penguins, but what do their reading sources look like? What if we ask them to read a journal article, a peer reviewed article, right? The font is like super teeny. It's in these weird columns. They're using language we don't understand. There's no like glossary of weird words and they're using Latin terms like pinguinicus, malicus, right? So the demands of the task are increasing rapidly. And remember, in 12th grade, those teachers are not teaching strategies for identifying main idea. So the demands of the task had gone way up and the supports had gone way down. And that creates another place that a lot of students are gonna fall into the gaps. And finally, there are systems of the school. And that's one that I think we all got a crash course in this year when we went to remote learning, when the shutdown occurred, right? So things like, um, you know, a kid in class who couldn't identify the main idea could raise their hand. They could turn and ask a buddy. They could look for a model. And all of that is taken away when they're doing remote learning. Um, things like logging into class on time, tech problems, turning in your homework, all of those systems were turned on their head and a lot of students really struggled. A lot of students started looking like they were having tremendous EF problems when frankly it was the systems of the school that were having the EF problems. So as we move forward and think about okay what are we going to do about executive function, I want you to remember that it's not just about kids with identifying identify learning or attention challenges, it's also about the demands we put on them and the systems we surround them with. Okay, if we take that ZPD and we kind of turn it into a bar chart like this, um, you know, be careful. Where is the task you're putting on your kids going to fall? When the demands of what you're asking a kid to do exceeds the strategies and supports they have, the funnel is clogged, right? If you ask me to do a calculus test, my funnel is clogged. But if you gave me strategies to break down the assignment and some tutoring, I could probably do it, right? So we got to take those tasks and put them into a place where the demands are met by supports, where we move them into that independent phase by teaching them strategies, asking them questions, and building their confidence, and not just kind of pulling the rug out from under them. Um, so let me take a second have some, some more coffee, and we're gonna move into looking at SMARTS and how we've created a curriculum that is designed to address um, the needs of our students. All right. So, um, like I said before, SMARTS is a strategy instruction curriculum. There are six units. Um, each one has about two to five lessons, so there's 30 lessons total. Every lesson has lesson plans, PowerPoint presentation, we're gonna get into that as we go, activity sheets, strategy reflection sheets, all that good stuff. Um, you'll notice that the units are arranged in those areas of executive function that I showed you before. So unit one is all about foundational stuff. You know, what teaching kids, what is executive function? What does it mean to use a strategy? Because, you know, we shouldn't assume that they know what a strategy is. Honestly, we shouldn't assume that we as teachers know what a strategy is, but that's a story for another time. Um, and then the other units follow the areas of the COGS, goal setting, cognitive flexibility, organizing, remembering, and self-monitoring and self-checking. Um, an important thing to mention is the curriculum is entirely modular. You can teach lessons in any order you want. So even though there's 30 lessons, that does not mean that you're going to spend 30 hours teaching EF. I know that's a big challenge for most educators. You are able to create customized scopes and sequence with this curriculum to meet the specific um, needs of the class or the students you're working with. And we'll get into that more. So this is just a snapshot of unit three. So unit three is that shifting flexibly um, unit. And you'll see there's five units here. The first one, unit 3.1, is about um, understanding complexities when you're reading, multiple meanings of what you're reading. 3.2 is hilarious. It's, um, it's about shifting your writing based on purpose, audience, or what's the third one? purpose, audience, or author, um, kind of rewriting something based on who you are and the message you're trying to convey, which is very challenging for many writers. Skim and Scoop is a one of our most popular. It's a strategy for identifying main ideas. Oh, how funny. We just talked about that. Um, it's great for reading comprehension, great for standardized tests, etc. 3.4 is a highlighting strategy. Uh, guess what? Kids are not good at highlighting. This is a great one to teach them how to use highlighting based on the purpose. Why am I reading this and how can I use highlighters to accomplish my goal? Um, 3.5 is for math. Um, how can I shift as I approach math in different ways? I love 3.5 because a lot of kids, you say math and they get like the deer in the headlights look, 
you can do 3.5 without doing any calculation. You can just think about math, which is a, a great way to shift how students approach problems. But you'll notice that this addresses many different academic tasks. So you as the teacher can pick and choose the lessons that you need um, to kind of custom where we are. So you might teach one lesson before a certain task and you might save another for another time or even another year. Um, this is the pedagogical model of every SMARTS lesson. Um, and you've seen this before, guided release or you know, explicit instruction. It's, not, um, it's certainly not radical. Um, every lesson has four instructional components. Activate prior knowledge, model strategy used successfully, practice independently, and then reflect and wrap up. And by going through each one of those, you're able to accomplish those outcomes we talked about before, showing students how it should be done. You know, we should not assume that a kid has the strategies they need to read a peer-reviewed article or to organize their backpack or to use a planner for that matter. We teach strategies explicitly, okay? And then we let them practice it, and then we get them a chance to reflect and wrap up and build that metacognitive understanding. And by following those instructional components, that is the way to be most successful in students adopting EF strategies. Um, now we're gonna look through some of the materials that come with a SMARTS lesson. Um, the lesson plan being first. So these are some of the components that break down the lesson. Um, just to look, so this is the guided instruction part. This is where the teaching actually happens. And if you see those guys on top, activator, guided, independent practice, and wrap up and reflection, those are those four components I mentioned before. Now, a lesson is supposed to take an hour. That can vary depending on who you're teaching. If you do one-on-one, -on -one, it could be faster. If you're doing a big class or students kind of you know, um, high needs, that can be slower. But um, the lessons can be chopped apart. Any one of those four components could kind of stand alone. So I have a lot of teachers who do half an hour and they do activator and guided, and then they come back later and do half an hour to do independent practice and reflection. Um, especially during remote learning, a lot of teachers were doing the activator could be um, before you come to class, guided together, independent practice is on your own, wrap up and reflections together. Um, you can kind of chop it that way as well. Um, now, every, speaking of remote instruction, every lesson comes with a PowerPoint, and that is a saving grace during remote instruction because it models the strategy perfectly. All you gotta do is get your kids on Zoom, throw up that PowerPoint, and you just walk through it together. It models how to use the strategy for the kids and for yourself. Um, if you look down below, and if I have, oh, I don't have that animated. Um, down here, this is the lesson guide. Uh, this is the lesson plan. This is the script for the teacher to follow. So you, as the teacher, can keep up with yourself by following the lesson plan down to the presenter notes. Also, the PowerPoints are entirely modifiable. Um, you know, some kids, when I'm working with older kids, they just hate pictures. So I just go through and take all the pictures out, take out the color, make it look as boring as possible. I don't know, my older students like that. You could add more pictures. You can change the Lexile level. You can add assignments or um, characters from something you're reading. So the PowerPoint is where you can do a lot of the modification and modeling during remote learning or in person. I use them in person too. Um, the worksheets, so every lesson comes with handouts that students can use. Um, these are typable, they're fillable forms. They are PDFs, but they're fillable. So you can print them out and distribute them hard copy in person, or you can distribute them um, through your Google Classroom or Canvas. You can distribute them as PDFs that kids can type on and save and so turn back to you. So this is where kids do a lot of the learning. Also, I love in, in Zoom, by the way, let's see if I can do this you know, smoothly, but you can use, the um, annotate feature to do some of the learning. Um, if you want to model some strategies together, you can use annotate and do some of that together. Um, okay, that was fine. I'll clear that. Okay, cool. And we also have a lot of opportunities for. Oh, did I do that? We also have a lot of opportunities for. Um, Reflection, okay, I've mentioned it like a million times and I'll mention a million more. Um, reflection is crucial. So feedback and reflection are very, very important when you're doing executive function. So in SMARTS, we have feedback forms for the student and the teacher. This is a glimpse at some of the reflection sheets we use with students. What strategy did you use? Did you like it? Would you use it again? Why or why not? By asking those questions, that is gonna to lead to that long-term executive function um, growth that you wanna see. You know, Just doing a strategy one time will help them on one assignment. But by coming back and asking, did you like it? And by getting other kids to share what they did, you know, you know it's working. So if you look at this one on the right, this is the most scaffolded one. And you know, I'm working with um, a lot of teenagers and they'll say, oh, I don't like it, it takes too much time. I'm like, okay, tell me more. Like, oh, it doesn't match how I learn. Great, 
let's try this one instead. And then they'll be like, oh, it didn't, I didn't like it. But you know it's working when they say, I didn't like it, here's what I did instead. So by engaging in strategy reflection, you're gonna get students talking about strategies and you're going to increase the likelihood that they'll develop and adopt their own strategies. So strategy reflections are really crucial for that. Um, and yeah, I mean, we are hard at work this summer. I've got some great things coming up for the secondary curriculum. Um, we are working on some extensions. So every lesson is going to have some suggestions on, okay, what do you do next? Um, we're looking at extensions around community building, self-advocacy, papers and projects, test taking, um, science and math, and English and social sciences. So we're gonna give you some easy to use ways to take that lesson and help students apply it to common challenges in those areas. Um, we're also working on some of our activities, working to make them more engaging, to make sure they're you know, more culturally inclusive, and also to make sure they address the needs of high performing students. You know, a lot of students in late high school and college need this executive function support, but sometimes they don't see that they need it. So we're working on some ways to kind of sell it to them as, okay, getting ready for college, you need this. So we'll have some great activities coming up along those lines. And then finally, we just wanna help support you in picking your lessons. We're gonna have have a lesson sorter that helps you quickly select your lessons here, there, and everywhere. We've got a quiz you can take to get a two-page customized report for here's what you can do. We're also going to be having quarterly smarts conversations where all teachers come together and brainstorm and share their ideas. So these are some great, um, great supports we're working on. Oh, look, it's coming in summer 2022. So, okay, I will fix that. This is my new um, PowerPoint template that I just got a few days ago. So sorry about that little typo. But yeah, we've got some great stuff coming um, up for our teachers in the coming academic year. Another resource that's available to smart secondary teachers are our Metacog surveys. The Metacog surveys is a executive function survey system that was developed by Dr. Meltzer, actually published in 2004. Um, there's a number of surveys that address kids' motivation and effort, as well as their strategy use. And then there's the teacher perceptions, where you as a teacher can kind of check in on where you see your student at. This is a great, um, these surveys are a fantastic way to kind of track students' development of not only their use of executive function, but also some of the other elements of that paradigm we showed you, their effort, persistence, motivation, et cetera. And you can use that to do pre and post. You can use it to kind of set your instructional priorities. You can use it to kind of help students get to know who they are as learners and share some of that feedback with them. We're working on piloting some really interesting interactive features on that. I don't think it'll be available to the public in this coming year, but I am hoping to pilot with some interested teachers. So stay tuned for that as well. And then finally, we just have a lot of help around planning. You know, I, I think when I say that issue about how modular the curriculum is, you know, guess what? You can cut and you can slice and dice these 30 lessons in whatever way it matters to you. I think at first it's like, oh, that's great. And then it's like, oh, wait, that's a lot of work. We have a lot of support for you around how to do that. Um, from our getting started guide to our planner, to our customized getting started quiz, to those conversations, the lesson sorter. So whatever you do, do not worry. We will not leave you high and dry. As Elizabeth said, you know, we are real people. We love executive function and we are here to help you plan out your um, SMARTS year. So that was your crash course in what SMARTS is like at the secondary level. I'm going to take a second and talk about where is SMARTS being used? Remember we said there are literally over 2,000 teachers who've gotten their hands on SMARTS, well, where are they using it? Who owns executive function in the building, um, in education, in a school building or otherwise? So we'll go through those tiers, I'll show you some examples, and we'll wrap up with six steps you can use to get started. So these are the tiers of EF support that we are most used to seeing, right? Starting with, you know, the least number of students, but the most concentrated, down to the entire school. So let's to look at those tiers and think about you know, what's good and bad about each one. Well, strengths and challenges, not good and bad. So this is where a lot of schools will start with their EF support um, in special education or kind of focusing on EF skills building, right? So in, um, this is when the special ed teacher has academic resource room or kids are being pulled out of class for EF support or maybe even well, push in, I think, kind of spans this tier in the next one. But basically, the point is we're focusing on EF for EF's sake. Um, instruction is not taking place in the context of a content class. And the instruction is being done by, you know, a specialist who focuses on a specific population of students, okay? Um, there's some great things about this. Um, it's a lot of times it's easier to differentiate. It's differentiation by definition. Also, you have dedicated time and space for it. Also, you're working with a teacher who has been trained more in this sort of differentiation support. 
Um, some challenges we see in this area is because it's not tied to specific content necessarily, it's harder for kids to generalize. Um, you get kids who say, well, I only do that in Ms. Brown's class. I don't need to do it in math. I don't need to do it in science. So the challenge is a bit more on you to build those bridges that we talked about earlier. Um, this is one example. This is a high school class in New Jersey. And um, the class is called Multidisciplinary Studies. And basically, executive function is one of the big components using SMARTS. So look at that on the left. Look at the bottom thing there. There is a final for the class in June based on executive function. I love that. There's a final on executive function. We're teaching kids what EF is and why it matters. And I'm going to test you on it. Um, so these are kids who can do homework sometimes, but they always have to use EF strategies when they're doing their homework. Um, also, there are assignments that are based on EF explicitly. You can see in the back. It says, find a staff member who doesn't have a planner. I could talk about planners all day, every day. Kids think that they don't need them because it's about like memory. I'm like, no, planners are adult tools. So in this assignment, the kids have to interview adults on how they use planners and do a presentation on the different ways adults are using time management tools. Okay, so I love that. I love that as an example for the top tier. The next tier is about bringing executive function into those contexts with high EF demands. Remember in our um, quizzes, remember that gap between eighth grade and ninth grade? Transition years are huge for executive function, sixth grade and ninth grade. As we know as educators, those are unfortunate years where we lose a lot of kids. Um, in fifth grade, I love school, so much fun. Sixth grade, I guess, I, I guess I'm bad at school. I don't like it anymore. And I believe that a lot of that is um, some of the unmet needs for executive function, right? Sixth grade, now we expect them to track their different classes and use a planner and, and go from class to class and do their homework independently, right? So um, integrating executive function into transition years is a great idea. Same thing with things like project-based learning, research papers, standardized tests, finals. These are um, times of year where everyone is at risk for executive function overload. So by integrating executive function there, we can kind of proactively address what could be a challenging moment. Um, in this case, instruction may take place in support class or in content or even both. We've seen some really interesting team teaching on some of this stuff. Um, I love this because the connection is direct. We're doing project-based learning, here's your EF strategy. Welcome to sixth grade, here's your EF strategy. Also the buy-in is a little bit easier for students and teachers. They understand why they're being asked to do it immediately and the teachers are grateful for it because it makes their lives easier. Um, it's hard to differentiate. If I'm talking about all sixth grade, how am I gonna meet the needs of the kids who are most at risk? Time can be a challenge if you're already teaching a research paper, where are you gonna find the time? And um, you may not be calling executive function by its name. I think that you should, um, but I understand people don't. My example for this is actually coming from Boston Public Schools. They have, a, they have the Office of Opportunity Gaps who has um, launched something called Excellence for All. It's a program that seeks to um, engage students in you know, um, underperforming schools to get them ready for honors level courses later on in their academic career by engaging them with high level content. Um, so these kids have been doing a capstone project, um, which is a high level, you know, multidisciplinary research paper, basically, and presentation, sometimes to the entire district. So we use executive function, we create a framework under three phases, plan your project, do your project, and reflect on your project. And they use that throughout the year to get these kids ready. We weave executive function. So as we talk about note-taking, we teach them an EF strategy for note-taking, then they do note-taking. As we talk about organizing your presentation, EF strategy for organization, then they do it. And it's kind of woven in throughout. And last is structures and systems of the school. Remember we talked about what happened when we went to remote learning and how EF challenges really skyrocketed. Well, as a district or as a building, you can take ownership of executive function and make sure that kids and teachers and families are supported with executive function throughout. Um, so advantages involves everyone, administrators, teachers, students, everybody. It, we all own executive function in this sort of a model, and it's also easier to plan for the different tiers. The challenge, of course, is that it's very time intensive. You know, in the schools we've done this with, they do a bit of a needs assessment. It takes a lot of time from the principal or the superintendents. And also you have to collect data. You can't just create a framework and then assume it works perfectly. You have to be tracking how well it goes and tweaking it as it goes. So this is an example. Um, this is a middle school in Boston. I believe, or maybe New Jersey, we, do it. we have a couple schools working on this. And you'll see that they've aligned different executive function strategies with different tasks 
um, who is going to receive it, as well as who, what classes and when. So by building these frameworks throughout the year, they can ensure that all kids are receiving executive function support. So I love this approach. Um, I would not recommend doing this one in your first year, but this is an excellent goal that I hope that many, many schools will adopt as we move forward. So that was a crash course in the three different tiers of executive function. So your brains are probably swirling. I know I talked fast, I'm throwing a lot of knowledge at you. So I wanna take a second, let's kind of take a deep breath and here are some six steps with some questions you can ask yourself as you decide what executive function will look like for you in the coming year. So the first one is identify those clogged funnels. You don't need, to, executive function doesn't need to be everything for everyone. Remember that when we talk about executive function, I want you to talk about concrete and visible tasks that you're seeing your kids do. Okay, what challenges specifically are you trying to solve? And how does that relate to the exact demands you're putting on your kids? You don't need to, it's not a magic wand. This is about real concrete behaviors you see every day. So picking those can really help you narrow your focus. Um, then you can pick your resources. You know, I love smarts, in case that's not obvious. Um, but, you know, the strategies you use need to match the problem you're trying to solve. Maybe it's about adopting planners. Maybe it's about, you know, coaching on how to navigate your learning management system, about more, you know, information for parents, right? So picking the EF resources that support all the stakeholders in the system and give them the strategies they need to be successful. Um, be strategic, you know, set yourself up to be successful. Sometimes a district will contact us and say, we want smarts for all our, all our teachers. I want all, everyone in the middle school to have it and be doing it. And even though I would love, you know, for smarts to be adopted nationally, I encourage them to start with a pilot. See how this um, meshes with your school. What are those organic success points that you can build on? And align executive function with existing goals. It's so much easier to get teacher buy-in when you say, you know that research paper that was really hard? We're bringing executive function in there. Instead of saying, guess what? Executive function. Align it with what they're already doing and you'll set yourself up to be more successful. Um, collect data. How will you know it's working? Okay. How are you going to know that this is working for you and your kids? Um, I encourage you to think beyond just grades. Um, thinking about reflection as a way to do data collection is really powerful. Setting goals and tracking how well your students are doing towards those goals can be so, so powerful. And then um, keep it growing, right? Um, all students, the truth is, and I hope that we've kind of made that point today, we all need executive function. We use it in our everyday life. It's one of those things that um, it's, you know, and no, listen, I love biology, but I don't really use biology in my day-to-day -day life. Many people do, but I don't. Um, you know, I don't use what I learned about US history, although I love history, but I do use executive function. The skills I was working on in high school and college are the things that keep me moving um, in my professional life. So we need to really own executive function in our education practices. So how can we grow that? How can we continue to integrate it? not to reinvent the wheel, but to make executive function visible and explicit for all of our kiddos. Um, so just by asking yourself those questions, you can come up with an executive function plan that's gonna help you in the coming year and beyond. Um, so I talked a lot, I was able to see the chat a little bit. We have a few minutes, which I'll address a question or two. Or wait, Elizabeth, you have a ending spiel, don't you? Let's do the ending spiel and then I'll do a little bit of um, Q&A if there's time, but I'm going to leave my email up there so that you can reach out with your questions and comments as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, Michael. And we've had some great questions in the chat too. Before, uh, I know people have to run, um, but uh, if you have to leave, I just want to make sure that you know that you have the evaluation form. So you will get an email about this as well. But um, there it is right now for those of you who like to jump on those things and get them done fast. Again, we really, really, really value your feedback um, because we just want to make our next webinars better. Also, if you fill out the evaluation form, you will get the email that says, hey, you were here for this webinar. Um, and then also, if you need the sort of fancy certificate version, um, fill out the evaluation form. You can click, uh, there's an option right there you can click and we will get in contact with you to how to do that. And again, those uh, certificates are $15. But if you just fill out the evaluation form, you'll get the standard email that says that you are here for this webinar. Also, um, the, we, most people ask, we have a PDF with uh, the slides. 
um, from this webinar. Uh, and we, this will also be in the email that we send you out. Uh, but just for those of you who want to get that right, um, right now. Um, and then, uh, you know, I have, Michael, do you want to take some questions? Then I'll do my various plugs. Those are the sort of major things. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, fill out that evaluation form if you need to log off, that's totally fine. Um, I do see someone asking about um, doing smarts outside of school, like an OT or a clinical setting. Honestly, it's, it's very doable. I actually use it all the time in my one-on-one -on -one, um, at therapy. You know, advantage, it's super easy to personalize. You can pick the strategies that belong to that kid. Most activities work fine one-on-one. -on -one. There's a couple that are kind of based on groups, which can, you know, so maybe one or two you probably could not do. Um, also, I didn't never used to use PowerPoints one on one, although I do now um, since we're doing it remotely. But otherwise, it's absolutely fantastic. The important thing is building that bridge. So you need to make sure you know what they're actually being asked to do in school and help the kid apply it to what they're doing in school. But otherwise, it can absolutely be used in that setting. Um, I see one more about homeschooling and how to scale back strategies that you naturally implement. That's an excellent question. So I'm not a parent, so I can't tell you if this is the way that parenting must be done. But I will tell you one really important thing is that metacognition. You know, if your kid is, is throwing a fit because you keep telling them to clean your room, um, if you can make the strategy explicit, here's what I expect the room to be clean, how I want it to be clean, and then getting the kid to reflect, well, okay, you have your own strategy. How did that go? What do you want to change about it? By letting them kind of develop a little bit of their own ownership and metacognition around cleaning the room, you can start to feel more comfortable in handing that power off. Um, another great tool for parents, by the way, are the Smart But Scattered book series. I love Smart But Scattered from Dawson and Guar, so check that out on Amazon. Um, okay, Elizabeth, why okay. don't you kind of do that? And then everyone just keep my email, email me. Let's talk about executive function, yeah. all right? Indeed. And yeah, if you have any specific questions we didn't get to, you can uh, definitely contact Michael. Also, again, I just wanted to let you know about the Smart Summer Summit, uh, which is uh, our early book special for that is ending tomorrow. So I just wanted to make sure that you have that. It is July 28th, 30th, August 4th and 6th. It's 10 hours of uh, fabulous presentations by people on our team. Michael, again, I'll be there. Um, and we'll go more into depth about the sort of things that you saw today here. Uh, so definitely wanted to let you know about that. We mentioned briefly also, basically we have two virtual conferences coming up. There's the Smart Summer Summit, which is very SMARTS focused. And then we have our 35th annual Learning Differences virtual conference, uh, which has been rescheduled from the spring. Um, and this is, uh, we've got higher level um, things about uh, learning differences about executive function. We have amazing speakers, not just from our organization, but from all over. So there's a lot of cool information there. So that's coming up. And then of course, um, if you are interested in the SMARTS program uh, as, as it is, uh, then you can come to uh, the SMARTS website and you can just uh, check that out. Again, we have, there's two different curriculums. There's the elementary curriculum and the secondary curriculum. There's 30 lessons each, and each lesson has PowerPoints and videos and worksheets and everything. Also, if you fill out the evaluation form or if you just go to the SMARTS website, you can get a free lesson for each of those uh, curriculums. That way you can actually kind of see what we're about. Also, I will just put all of our various links uh, in the chat as well. This will also be in your email. Um, but the SMARTS website itself is a great resource because we have um, various, uh, we have our blog, which has, we update every week. It's got stuff about our organization, but it's also just got a lot of interesting um, aggregated articles from all around the web about executive function, about learning differences. We're doing a, we're doing a whole series on distance learning right now. So that's just a great free resource. We'd love to see you there. Um, and again, it's like, it's basically, uh, uh, Michael and I write most of the blogs, but other people in our organization do as well. So when you're there, you're really talking to us. Um, yeah. Also, again, our search YouTube channel, uh, we have tons and tons and tons of videos. We have uh, a great whole playlist of our free webinars. Now those webinars are ones we have um, from the past year, but also because we're doing much more online uh, learning and outreach, 
we have a whole series that we have done specifically in the last few months. So they are all there and they are free. A lot of them have to do with distance learning, distance learning and reading, distance learning and math, the various metacognition and how to deal with stress, things like that. So those are just all there as a free resource. Um, and then of course we have our, the SMARTS Twitter and the Research Childly Facebook page, which are really just, uh, it's really the SMARTS and Research Childly Facebook page. So those are great places to get in touch with us as well, as well as we just like to post uh, things that we're doing, but also we post a lot about sort of cutting edge, interesting research and education um, and different articles that come out. So those are great places to follow us as well. And then sort of doing this slightly backwards, but of course, but then there's Research ILD, Research Institute for Learning and Development, which is our parent co uh, company. So that has uh, a lot of the information about our conferences and then about our general staff and other things that we do. So uh, again, thank you all for being a great uh, audience. We really feel the difference when people are really engaged and we can tell they're asking great questions and we're just, uh, it's, it makes it great for us to reach out to uh, other educators and parents at this time. All right. All oh right, my gosh, 12 on the dot, yeah, look at us. Perfect, perfect. You guys have a great rest of the day. I hope your summer is feeling productive and uh, we look forward to hearing from you in the future. All right, Excellent. see you guys. Thanks so much, have a good day. Bye.